We needed a little pause there to catch our breath. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to Exodus chapter 14, that passage I read just a moment ago. I hope you picked up on what I think is the emotion of that passage, the panic that takes place, the anger of Moses, and as we will see in the next verse, which we haven't read yet, the chiding of Moses by God. Interesting. Especially in light of what Moses has just said here in the few verses. But the children of Israel, I mean, it's typical, almost Jewish humor, when you look there in verse 11, uh, how I ran into this kind of phraseology of things uh, when I lived in Israel. Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? You know, uh, very, very Jewish, what we see going on here in the text. And like, and the we told you so. Is this not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Now, if you go back over the text, you will not find that any place where the children of Israel said, let us alone, we want, we want to serve the Egyptians. Oh, they were miserable when the Egyptian taskmasters increased their burdens and they got mad at Moses over that. But did they want to serve the Egyptians? I think not. But Moses knows God. And what we see in verse 13 is Moses rebuking Israel for their fear because Moses knows the God whom he serves. Oh, that we might know the God whom we serve Fear ye not. Stand still. You can see the people agitated out there. Oh, you know, I've, I've had so many situations like that, and it frustrates me greatly. Stand still. Shut up. Be quiet. Listen to what I have to say. Oh, those of you who raise kids know that often happens. Those of you who are husbands know that sometimes, though you don't want to talk to your wife that way, the, you know that sometimes the wife is panicked. Some of you may have had husbands where the husband panics. And you say, cool it. Settle down. This is not the end of the world. Relax. How many of you have ever had to say that or have heard that said to you? Relax. Yes? <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody, almost everybody. Some of you don't raise your hand because you don't want to admit that somebody ever had to say relax to you and you've never been so uptight that you had to say relax to somebody else. That's what's happening here in the text. Moses knows they're in an impossible situation. Moses is not a greenhorn. Moses knows the scope of the land. Moses knows the territory. Moses is 80 years old. He has worked as a shepherd in the desert for years, and he knows what mountains mean. You have a very hard time crossing them, especially with at least two million people. Moses knows what a sea means, and nobody is a swimmer. Moses knows what the Egyptian army can do, and he sees them back there. But Moses knows God. when you really know the true, the living God, the one who is the sovereign Lord of the universe, the one who spoke a word and all of creation came into existence, you do not need to be afraid. How often and how easily we panic God is still on the throne. There are more than two dozen places in Scripture where we read the words, Fear not, or fear ye not, or be not afraid. That's a common condition of mankind. We fear for our finances, and we panic. 
We fear for our health, and we panic. We fear for our friendships, that something bad is happening, and we panic. We fear for our country, and we panic. We fear for our job, and we panic. Fear ye not. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you. And Moses knew the timing because it was an imminent crisis today. Moses speaks a prophetic word. You see them today. You'll hear them again, but you won't see them except dead. You'll see them again no more. You're worried about them today. God will take care of them. The Lord shall fight for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that because you are one of his children, that the Lord will fight for you? You are his people. You say, but what about all those martyrs who've been killed? What about all the Christians who have died? What about all the terrorists who have killed believers? What about what's happening in the world today in many of those countries where Islam or communism is in control? The Lord will fight for you. There are soldiers who die in battle, but we know the victory. Perhaps you'll be one of the heroes of faith in the first half of Hebrews chapter 11 who die for your faith. It's an honor. Perhaps you'll be one of the heroes of faith in the second half of Hebrews 11 who, lo who live and do great things. It's an honor. But we know who wins the battle. We don't have to worry about the old song. Don't bury me on the lone prairie where the coyotes howl and the wind blows free. Or don't bury me out in the wilderness just outside of Egypt. I hope you have your Bibles open by this time. Last week we looked at some of the passages in the Bible that tell us the exact date of the Exodus. That helped us to reach the conclusion as to what was going on at that time and to determine which archaeological remains to examine, where to look for Goshen, where to look for the storehouse cities of Python and Ramses and Sukkot and Etam and the other passage, uh, other places that are mentioned in our text. Knowing the biblical date for the Exodus told us exactly who the Pharaoh was when the Exodus took place. Knowing who the Pharaoh was told us exactly where his seat of government was located. We know where the capital of Egypt was during all of the dynasties. We have excellent records of the dynasties because they're carved in stone. That's important because Moses was making daily trips between the Jews and Pharaoh at his capital all the times the ten plagues were in progress. So the first issue that we tackled last week was the biblical date of the Exodus. We saw that the Bible gives several clear indicators concerning that date. According to Second Chronicles, the temple was completed in the 11th year of Solomon's reign, and the temple took 7.5 years to build. In that context, we saw the specific date of the temple measured from the Exodus. In 1 Kings 6, 1, we read, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So we've got the exact time frame set for us with exact years. We saw that the fourth year of Solomon's reign was between 967 at the earliest and 961 at the latest. Adding 480 years to that meant that the Exodus was between 1447 and 1441 BC. And I told you my personal conviction is that it took place in 1445 based on some other more complex figures that we won't go into. 
But you know, it really doesn't matter. You can choose any one of those dates in that spread there. You can choose 1447 or 1446 or 1444 or 1443 or 1442 or 1441. It doesn't matter because all of those dates are during the reign of Amenhotep II. So we know that Amenhotep II was the pharaoh of the Exodus. We saw that Solomon ruled for 40 years according to the scripture, 1 Kings 11:42. We saw that the Jews were in Egypt exactly 430 years to the day from the day that Jacob entered into Egypt up to Exodus, according to Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. God emphasizes the fact that we're not talking in general figures. We're not talking in round numbers. We're talking with precise dates. He wants us to know that. That means that Jacob and his sons entered to Egypt sometime between 1877 and 1871 B.C., depending on which of those years that you choose on the Exodus, which puts Abraham around 2000 B.C. We saw that there were additional passages of Scripture that can be shown to support the period of the Judges from 1400 B.C. to 1050 B.C., followed by Saul, David, and Solomon. So, you know, we've got a very tight chronology here. The liberals try to truncate that period of the Judges by making it only 100 to 150 years long instead of 250 to 300 years long, but to do that they have to completely ignore all of the chronology of the Old Testament. We saw that Egyptian history is well established during that period. It's the period called the New Kingdom, which begins with the 18th dynasty. We know who the pharaohs were of this period. We saw the key pharaohs of the 18th dynasty that were related to our text and what probably gave rise to the oppression of the Jews. We saw that that was the invasion of the Hyksos sometime uh, before 1570, because in 1570 is when they were driven out. That was when the 18th dynasty was established. We saw who those pharaohs were, Tutmose the first from 1525 to 1508 BC, and Moses was born at approximately 1520, so he was born under the reign of Tutmose I. And Tutmose also had a, a teenage daughter at that time named Hatshepsut, who is probably the princess that found Moses in the bulrushes. We saw that in Exodus 2. The next pharaoh is Tutmose II. He's the son of the first, obviously. He's the pharaoh who drowned the babies. And then we saw also that he died and his half-sister Hatshepsut came to power, taking care of his son, Thutmose III, who was the regent. And thus he, that is, Thutmose II, and also Moses would have been raised in the same family group. We talked about Hatshepsut, and when she ruled, we talked about Thutmose III. He was the son of the second by a concubine. He needed to have some kind of legitimacy to get to the throne, so he married the daughter of his aunt, and regent Hatshepsut. He was the pharaoh of the oppression at the time that Moses came to manhood and killed the Egyptian. He was very vicious, very powerful, won 17 major military campaigns, probably envied Moses who was a Jew but who had the right of an adopted son. And he was very glad when finally Moses did something stupid and he was able to go after him. And then we saw Amenhotep who ruled from 1450 B.C. to 1425 B.C., the son of Thutmose III and his wife, who was the daughter of Hatshepsut, and he was the pharaoh, that is, Amenhotep II, was the pharaoh of the Exodus. We saw that it was important to know that because that lets us know where the land of Goshen was, because we know where the capital was. We know the entire 18th dynasty, the capital was down at Thebes and Luxor and Karnak, which is between 450 and 480 miles south. You know, the Nile River runs north. There are only a few rivers in the world that run north. The Nile is one of them, and it runs north. And so up near the Nile Delta is where the liberals put the land of Goshen. But that means that Moses would have had to be making a 480 mile trip each way every day, almost a thousand miles round trip a day to get down to Pharaoh. Now we know that it's quite possible that God could uh, super transport him if he wanted to. There's nothing in the text about that. I mean, God did that with uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But there's nothing in the text about God doing that with Moses or with all the elders of Israel. And there's a constant communication going on between those two groups back and forth every day. Moses made daily trips. 
The Egyptians had totally enslaved all the non-Egyptian people at that time. We talked about that in relation to the Hyksos. I showed you on your map, I passed out some maps last week uh, that had on the front side a, a, an outline map of Egypt and on the back side had some pictures of the uh, area of Thebes and all the temples and the ruins that are located there. It's a magnificent place. Hope I get to go sometime. My son Philemon has been down there. Uh, he took like 4,000 photos uh, in a two-week period. <laughs> He's a great photographer. A wonderful, incredible, interesting place. But anyway, uh, we saw that from there were two caravan routes that go from that capital area over to the Red Sea, where it is a wide body of water. We'll talk about how wide when we get to that point. We'll talk about the time involved, whether or not they really had time to do it within the time frame allotted in Scripture to get that many miles across the sea. We pointed out that there are two ruined storehouse cities on those two caravan routes. One on each route, which I posit would be Python and Ramses, that have not been excavated. And it makes sense to have storehouse cities on the trade route between the capital of the country and the Red Sea, which opens up the vista for all the rest of the world for trade. I hope someday somebody excavates those cities. We saw that there are a mountain range along the coast there, and there are two passes that go through. The two gorges. We saw Pihacharot is the mouth of the gorges. Baal Tzafon, the master of the north. We talked about the fortification that guarded the northern route right there along the edge of the sea. Pharaoh was delighted. He saw the wilderness had boxed them in. They had no place to escape. And that's precisely what God wanted. And that's why the people panic in our text today. But Moses knows the lay of the land, and this is the way God led. And Moses has learned to follow God. Even when he knows it doesn't make sense. Have you ever been in that situation? To, to follow God here? I mean, if I really obey what God says, what kind of a pickle will that put me into? I mean, I mean I, I'm in total, total distress. Lord, do you really want me to do that? There may be somebody listening to this message, whether here in this auditorium or on the mission field or on the internet, that's been called to the mission field. And you came up with all the reasons why you couldn't possibly go Marilyn Fawcett was 19 years old when she went to the mission field so when God called her you know what it meant that she gave up everything here including a young man that was interested was it worth it she will tell you yes. You follow God where he wants you to go. You do what he wants you to do even if it doesn't make sense. Moses knew the lay of the land. He was in the privileged class for 40 years. Do not think that he traveled the land of Egypt. And then for 40 years, he wandered in the wilderness taking care of sheep. Do not think that he knew the lay of the land. But he saw the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud and he heard the voice of the Lord and he said I will follow where he leads me I will follow he'll be with me all the way will you follow him Dear people, we're coming into a time when you're going to have to make that decision. 
it will look impossible it will look scary it will look dangerous as dangerous as the box canyon in which the children of Israel find themselves with screaming murderous Egyptians following them as fast and hard as they can will you panic like Israel did for Moses had to speak to them I think in anger quit jumping around stand still be silent open your eyes and see the salvation of the Lord we know who wins this battle Revelation 19 makes it clear there are practical lessons in the text I hope we're learning them Pharaoh is happy they're boxed in but God wants them there because God has a special mountain not located in Sinai God has a special mountain that is located in Arabia where he is going to cut a covenant with Israel his chosen people and he will show them his terror as the mountain quakes and as it burns with fire and as the cloud descends upon it and it's covered with smoke and they have to set a barrier around the bottom lest anybody touch the mountain and die he is God and how lightly we treat him we made one final note on the historical side that all along the western side of the Sinai Peninsula making it obviously impossible for the Jews to use that route as in most of your Bibles there are Egyptian turquoise and copper mines which were heavily fortified heavily guarded and loaded with slaves at this time who were mining for the Egyptians they could never have gone around the end of the Sinai Peninsula now two weeks ago I passed out copies of a wrong map that's found in most of your standard Bibles we saw that most of the key place names either are absent or have a question mark next to them that's because no evidence has ever been found that those are the locations that the Jews fleeing from Pharaoh stopped there at the Exodus there's no indication they were ever in those areas now I want to pass out some more copies of that same map today because I suspect that probably most of you anyway didn't bring your maps back so if I could have a helper come up here and pass these out this is the same one you've got if you've already got your own that's that's fine but uh, if you don't have your map let me give you more copies because I have another very important point here. another important point to make about what you see on this map and what you don't see on this map the reason I'm passing out the maps again is because I want you to see how many places are missing on it the liberals who drew these original maps don't want you to know about some of the other places in the Bible which lists many other places that the children of Israel stopped on their journey you know the passage we just finished looking at in Exodus only lists a handful of the stopping places but listen to what we read in the book of Numbers now this passage that I'm going to read you in just a second here in the book of Numbers is Moses personal list it's sort of like his personal record or his journal of every place that they stopped over 40 years in the wilderness it's like his own personal diary it says so listen to what we read oh by the way uh, as I read numbers 33 the reason I gave you the map as I read numbers chapter 33 please follow along on the bad map and see how many of these places you can find on the bad map okay so now I'm going to start reading in, X, uh, in numbers chapter 33 these are the journeys of the children of Israel which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron now here we have it this is Moses personal journal and Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord and these are their journeys according to their goings out now the first part of the list is the same thing we saw back there in Exodus 
They departed Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgment. Now I want to pause there in the text for just a second because that answers a very important question. How could a minimum of two million people get up and start walking out of Egypt without anybody noticing it? And why didn't Pharaoh immediately try to stop them? Well, the text tells us. It specifically says that the Egyptians saw them going out with a high hand, a phrase that means with utter impudence, total impunity, with arrogance, as with a challenger or dare, like, so we're going out. So what are you going to do about it? Come on, try to stop us. We're going, man. We're going. We're out of here. You see that? We're out of here with a high hand. Jews are going to change that attitude, of course, by the time they get to the Red Sea and see Pharaoh coming after them. But that's the attitude they went out with. <laughs> we got you, baby. Our kids are alive. Your kids are dead. We're out of here. We're tired of serving you Egyptians. Watch us go. See me? Hey, 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 hey. That's what it means with a high hand. And the Egyptians saw them going. Can you imagine the grief? The terror. Here goes Israel, and our firstborn is dead. And all over Egypt, the firstborn is dead. That's your first reason. There are hundreds of thousands, perhaps even a million dead babies and children and teenagers and young adults and even married people who were firstborns who suddenly dropped dead. Think about that. Funeral directors would have had a rough time with that one. Before following Israel the next morning, everybody was burying their firstborn. They didn't say, well, let's go chase them and leave our firstborn dead here in the house. They had some rituals they had to go through. They had some embalming they wanted to do. They had to dig some holes. They had to bury their dead. The second reason is also given. The people knew that none of the gods of Egypt could help them. They couldn't count on any of those gods because God, Jehovah, had just defeated all of their major gods in the ten plagues of Egypt. We talked about each one of the gods that was targeted every time God sent a plague. Now we're down to verse 5. Here we begin to see the list. And the children of Israel were moved from Ramesses and pitched in Sukkot. And they departed from Sukkot and pitched in Etam, which is in the edge of the wilderness. And they were moved from Etam and turned again unto Pihahirot, which is before Baal Siphon. And they pitched before Migdal. And they departed from before Pihahirot and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness. And they went three days' journey into the wilderness of Etam and pitched in Mara. And they were moved from Mara and they came to Elim. And in Elim there were twelve fountains of water and threescore and ten palm trees and they pitched there. And they were moved from Elam and encamped by the Red Sea. And they were moved from the Red Sea and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. And they took their journey out of the wilderness of Sin and encamped in Dafka. And they departed from Dafka and encamped in Alush. And they moved from Alush and encamped in Rephidim, where was no water for the people to drink. And they departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. And they moved from the desert of Sinai and pitched in Kibrot Hata'aba, which means luster's graves. That's a very interesting story we get to later in the text. And they departed from Kibrot Hata'aba and encamped in Hazaroth. And they departed from Hazaroth and pitched in Rithma. And they departed from Rithma and they pitched in Rimon Paraz. And they departed from Rimon Paraz and pitched in Libna. And they moved from Libna and pitched in Rissa. And they journeyed from Rissa and pitched in Kehelatha. And they removed from Kehelatha and pitched in Mount Safir. And they removed from Mount Safir and encamped in Harada. And they removed from Harada and pitched in Mahelot. And they removed from Mahelot and encamped in Taha. And they removed from Taha and pitched in Tara. And they removed from Tara and they pitched in Mikha. And they removed from Mitka and pitched in Hashmona. And they were departed from Hashmona and encamped in Moseroth. And they departed from Moseroth and they pitched in Benija Akan. And they removed from Benija Akan and encamped in Horhagid. God. By the way, you're going to have to say this after me. Next, we're going to read it again, and you're going to pronounce all these words, right? <laughs> and they went from Korhagid uh, God and pitched in Jotbatha, 
and they removed from Jalbatha and encamped in Ebrona, and they departed from Ebrona and encamped at Etzion Gaber, and they removed from Etzion Gaber and pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh, and they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there in the fortieth year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. And Aaron was an hundred and twenty and three years old when he died in Mount Hor. And King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the children of Israel. And they departed from Mount Hor and pitched in Zalmonah. And they departed from Zalmonah and pitched in Punan. And they departed from Punan and pitched in Oboth. And they departed from Oboth and they pitched in Ijeabarim, and the border of Modet, uh, Moab. And they departed from Im and pitched in Dibon Gad. And they removed from Dibon Gad and encamped in Almond Diblathaim. And they removed from Almond Diblathaim and pitched in the mountains of Abarim before Nebo. And they departed from the mountains of Abarim and pitched in the plains of Moab by J J Jordan near Jericho. And they pitched by Jordan from Beth Jesimot even unto Abel Shittim in the plains of Moab. That's a list, isn't it? And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab. You'll see why I told you this in a second. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. So to remind you about walking into a Roman Catholic facility. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. Now that's interesting. Because it says you're going to give, when they've got a lot of people, you're going to give them a bigger piece of property. When they have only a few people, you're going to give them a smaller piece of property. By the way, you don't get to decide I do. You're going to do it by lot. God controls the lot. That's why a Christian should not gamble. Number one, it's God's resources. It belongs to him. It's his money. You're only a steward of it. And number two, since he controls the lot, you are not going to win. Don't waste God's money. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the Lamb from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Which reminds us, if we disobey, God may give us some success, but he gives us pain with the failure. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Okay, now let's go back to that list. Did you count the places where Israel camped? Did you count it as we were going through the list? Or are you just trying to sort of follow along and see what is that big funny word that's there? There are 43 places listed in that list. 43. Now let me ask you a question. How long did Israel wander in the wilderness? 40 years. That means that on average, at least 2 million people, and I think there were more, but at least, two, even the liberals admit, will admit that if they admit that Israel got out of Egypt, at least 2 million people lived at each one of those places for a full year. Do you think 2 million people would make an impact on the environment? That they might leave some kind of a trace behind if they lived there for a full year? So I ask the question, are we to believe that all 43 of these places are in the Sinai Peninsula? or just south of Beersheba, except the last couple that are across the river from Jericho? Did you notice something else in that passage I just read you out of Numbers 33? Did you notice how much space the camp of Israel took up? It's huge. Look at verses 38, uh, 48 and 49. They departed from the mountains of Abarim and pitched in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. Now, normally when you see the picture storybooks and you, you know, you think about this in your mind, or maybe you've seen some of the children's cartoons that show uh, Israel and, you know, you look across the river and here's this sort of camp over there and it's, you know, sort of like a big Boy Scout jamboree camp. Some of you have been to Boy Scouts, some of you have been to the jamborees. 
you know, did you notice how big it is? It says, they pitched by Jordan from Beth Jesimoth even unto Abel Shatim in the plains of Moab. They tell us the northern and southern extent of the camp of Israel. That's a distance of between 10 and 12 miles. That's a pretty big camp. Let's put it this way. Imagine that you live somewhere up in, you know, Camden near the, uh, the bridge. And one morning you look out your window and you look across the river and you see people lined up on the other side of the Delaware River right across from you. You see all their tents all neatly lined up in sections with a banner over each section because remember when God told them to march through the wilderness he told them exactly where they were supposed to camp. They were to camp by tribes and there were going to be three camps on this side and three camps on this side and three camps on this side and three camps on this side. Tabernacle in the middle. They were each going to have their own banner and their own standard. They were, they were lined up exactly right. It was not a hodgepodge mess. Very organized. And you look right and you look left. And you see they're lined up for about 12 miles along the riverbank. And then you get up on a great big high tower. Picture yourself. You're down there looking across the river. No bridges at this time. You know, you don't have the Ben Franklin, you don't have the Walt Whitman, you don't have the uh, Commodore Berry Bridge, you don't have the Talcone, Palmyra, you know, Betsy Ross. None of those bridges exist. But you look across the river and you're on this high tower and you can see they extend back another 10 to 12 miles deep. And you see that they are all armed to the teeth and ready to cross the river. And they're waving their spears and they're waving their swords up in the air. Let me ask you a question. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. They are tough guys. During that time, they haven't just been lollygagging around. They've been busy with their various crafts, including making weapons. See, when they left Egypt, they were totally unarmed. But they've made some weapons in their wanderings because they had to fight some fights in their wanderings. Now, if you looked across the river right down here and you saw that, would you be afraid? How many of you would be afraid? What, you're not trusting the Lord? <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, in preparation for this message, I decided to look up a number. So, if you have your paper, write this number down. Here's the number. One, comma, five, six, seven, comma, zero, zero, zero. In other words, that's a little more than one and a half million. But it's, it's short by 500,000 of two million. 500,000 short of two million. That number... 1, 567, 000. That is the population of Philadelphia today. Philadelphia, even with the minimum number of Israelites, is 500,000 short of the minimum number of the Jews who crossed the Red Sea and then who eventually went into the land. That's a pretty big group of people, don't you think? Now, I looked it up on the internet, believe it or not. You know I'm a technical illiterate, but that is the population of Philadelphia. It's amazing. It only took me 17 hours to find that one fact. No, not really. Um, there are at least two million Jews. As far as I know, this passage that we're just looking at here in Numbers is the only clearly definitive passage that tells us how much extent of space the camp of Israel took up. As you have heard me preach in the past, I personally believe that there were probably at least six million Jews that left Egypt. And you know something? They did not practice birth control. They wanted kids. Orthodox Jews today still do and have, all have huge families. You see, the Pharaoh who had been killing their baby boys was 80 years before when Moses was born. 
That was back in the days, 80 years before the crossing, 80 years before Moses led them out, 80 years before is when the babies were being killed in Egypt. Moses was 80 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Remember, the guy who was Pharaoh when Moses was born was not the same Pharaoh as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Moses was born during the reign of Thutmose I. He grew up under the reign of Thutmose II and Thutmose III before killing the Egyptian when he was 40 years old. He fled to the wilderness for 40 years before returning under the reign of Amenhotep II. Eighty years have gone by since killing baby boys and the Jews wanted to have baby boys and Pharaoh said, we've got to kill the babies and we're going to start enslaving the Israelites. But the Pharaoh who killed babies was the first one. doesn't say anything about the rest of the Pharaohs killing babies. During the 40 years of wandering, more babies were born. The numbers of the Jews were growing, even with the first generation of adults over 20 dying in the wilderness. The Jews didn't have and didn't want Plan B. They didn't have oral contraceptives. They didn't have IUDs or condoms or shields or spermicide. They did not practice abortion. Orthodox Jews today do not practice abortion. The Jews wanted babies. They had God's special promises of blessings of the womb and of multiplying. These were God's people. It had happened in Egypt, and that's what made Pharaoh worried in the first place. And it was happening in the wilderness, this multiplication. I think it's far more reasonable to assume that they had between four and six kids on average, not the 1.8 children posited by the liberals to reach the figure of two million at the Exodus and the crossing of the Jordan. Okay, so now let's go back. I'm, man, I can't believe it. Our time is up. Okay, let's go back for a minute to the wild army of Philadelphia standing across the river from us. Now, the river is small compared to the Red Sea. I mean, you'd have a tough time getting across that river, but the river is small compared to the Red Sea and there were no bridges. God was going to cut a path through the sea for that huge number of people to cross. Even if you take the small number of two million, it's bigger than the population of Philadelphia. I want you to see this is a miracle. It's a real miracle. We'll see just how big it would have to have been later on in the text. First, I want you to think about this. Think about the huge camp. Think about 40 different camping spots over 40 years. And you got a camp that big. 40 different camping spots over 40 years with at least 2 million people camping out for a year at each spot. The liberals want us to believe that most of those spots are located on the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, so where are they? How could two million people camp in one location for a year and not leave a trace? How could six million people camp in one location for a year and not leave a trace? How could they do it 43 times and not leave a trace? Remember, this is not part of the world where they have constant rain and hurricanes and typhoons and natural disasters that would wipe out all traces of any human activity. I think it's far more reasonable to believe that the camping sites are in Arabia like the Apostle Paul says, but you can bet your bottom dollar that the Saudis don't want archaeologists checking out possible locations to prove that the history of their hated enemy is true and that the land of Israel is a divine land grant to the Jews. Remember also, we challenge you to try to figure out what Paul was talking about when he talked about Mount Sinai being in Arabia. That meant we had to look at the map and figure out where Arabia is in relation to most of the coast of Egypt. The Israelites crossed a body of water to get to Mount Sinai, and the Egyptians tried to cross and got drowned. They didn't just get muddy. They didn't just get wet. That's why we looked at the coastline of Egypt. Well, I wish we could go on, but we really are past time. Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word. It's powerful. It's exciting. It shows that you are the God who is there and you're the God who cares and you're the God who loves his people and you are the God who defends his people and we can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We don't have to be agitated. We don't have to be jerking around. We don't have to be wiggling and squirming and fuming and fussing and complaining and blaming other people. Always trying to pass the buck. We told you we wanted to stay in Egypt. We wanted to be slaves. Father, help us to relax. Help us to be at peace. Help us to know that you are God. And there is nothing too hard for you. 
help us to believe so strongly that when it appears that you are leading us into a box canyon and we know that it's a box canyon and we know the enemy is right behind and yet we're convinced that a certain thing is your will that we move forward with joy and then we wait to see what you will do you parted the sea for Israel you can certainly part whatever little problem stands in front of us and enable us to fulfill your will to move forward to do what you have called us to do not in the power of our own strength but in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray Amen our closing hymn for this morning is number 692 God will take care of you. That's what we